So, uh, Mike, did you make it through this first episode? I remembered almost immediately in the first five minutes what drove me away initially. <laughs> And it was, it's the freaking jump scares. Look, I, I have a lot of respect for the horror genre, especially when it's done well. But if there's one thing and one thing only that keeps me away from horror movies as an entire uh, genre, it's the idea of the jump scare. This idea that you're nothing's going to be happening, then all of a sudden a freaky noise is going to be made and something's <laughs> going to pop out at you. I'm very easily startled in real life, um, even by things that I shouldn't be. One time I remember screaming in the middle of my apartment because I... I took a happen glance in my peripheral vision at a coat hanging on a coat rack and I thought it was a real person. So that just shows how much I'm easily able to be spooked. So the fact that these things exist so much in our pop culture nowadays to generate scares is definitely one of my least favorite things about pop culture today. And I'll admit this was the thing that drove me away from Stranger Things and its initial inception. That being said, I was encouraged by you two gentlemen to push past my fears and get through the rest of the show. And I'm happy to say that through the first two episodes, I am supremely satisfied that I got past that first hurdle. <laughs> well, here's the thing about jump scares, at least my understanding of them from a scientific standpoint, is that the first one's always the worst. And then each subsequent jump scare doesn't, you know, scare you as much. Like, it doesn't have as much effect... Uh, to give you a classic example, uh, in Jaws, uh, the original testing didn't have um, the scene with the guy's head that came down and like scared, uh, was it Birdie ah! under the water? Not Birdie, uh, Hooper. Um, and uh, it was the scene that got everybody was when he was throwing chum and the shark jumped up. But he added the scene before, and what happened was that's the scene that everybody got scared about, and the later shark coming out didn't scare as many people. Th was this the same for you, Mike, in this, or would just every single one scare you? Uh, I mean, the first one was definitely the worst, but it almost... I mean, I've also conditioned myself. This happens every time I go to the movies, and I know that there's like a trailer. I'll usually try to like subtly look down or look at something else, because I know... <laughs> I just You just know when they hold on a shot, and it's dead silence... You know, something's going to pop out. Something's going to happen. Uh, there were a few, you know, loud noises going on throughout the rest of these two episodes, but nothing as bad as that first one in the first five minutes of the first episode. I don't know if it's necessarily a, a correlation causation thing that because my mind was so rattled from those first five minutes that everything else seemed tame by comparison, or if it was just that those other ones were not nearly as big spooks as how they decided to open up the entire series. Uh, Jack, for you, when we were doing our um, kind of preview episode uh, for Stranger Things with J. Jack and Mike, uh, you were like, what was the jump scare? Do you feel like watching it again now that you can kind of see where Mike was coming from? Yeah, at first I thought he was just being a big baby. But uh, I mean, I don't want to say it out loud. I think you just did. Very okay. implicit. Yeah, in your tone. I apologize. <laughs> but I, I, watching the, I started watching again. I go, oh, Okay. I get it now. I, I I get it. You know, the guy in the elevator, the bald the bald guy in the elevator. You know, he's gonna die. Yeah, that that's so, what made it uh, extra tragic for me is because you know I think at the time that I watched this, I hadn't been podcasting with you guys yet, but I just had a, an inkling of there's a a special bald man in my life that I'm about to become acquainted <laughs> with, and I I don't want to see them go in this way, shape, or form. So maybe that was it, just my own uh my own future self catching back up to me in a moment of deja vu. Because well, bald people are the ones that they're expendable. Mm -hmm. you, can, you, you can kill them off. Yes, really, as we all and, know, and, bald people get killed first in every horror movie. That's the trope, right? Well, they get killed in everything because nobody cares. Uh -huh. okay. they, get, they kill the movie and people go, I mean, ha have you ever gone back, Jay? This is how many You've watched it, what, two or three times now? This is my third run through. All right, did you go, God, whatever happened to that poor guy in the elevator? Yeah, you don't, you, you've never cared, yeah, have he's, you? because he's a uh, monster fodder, regardless of his hairline. Um, okay, all right. <laughs> but it, it, uh, it, 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 couldn't be, it couldn't be like George Clooney, like, or, like a, a really good looking See, George actor. Clooney would work, because that would be the, you know, the, it would be throwing you off. It's like, oh, George Clooney's going to live, you know. But then, yeah, oh, yeah. Crap, it's like, like when they put uh, Drew Barrymore in the beginning of Scream. Exactly, exactly. So, but, it, but, but. But would you, but if George Clooney were to die the whole time, why? Why'd they kill out George Clooney? Wow, why'd they kill out the really good looking guy, George Clooney? Oh, the ball headed guy? I oh, we're good with him. 
We're good. Again, this is you talking about how you don't like bald people. Either way, Mike, I'm we just, are I'm excited that. Uh, that you uh, passed through these uh, jump scares and made it through these first two episodes of Stranger Things. Welcome to Stranger Things with Jay, Jack, and Mike. My name is Jay. My name is Mike. And I'm the fake Harrison Ford. And welcome to the show. How's it going, guys? I, I, I don't get that. I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to start off the, the podcast on that <laughs> tone, but I, I, I legitimately do not understand that. I said it when Jay and I did a binge watch mm-hmm. um, on this. The, the guy, uh, David Hal- Harbor, that plays Jim Hopper. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you're not looking at the screen, Sounds just like Harrison Ford. Okay, I can see. So he's like voice double for so Harrison sound Ford. Alike. I can see that. Yeah, he's. I don't know if he's trying to do Harrison Ford. I don't know if that's his normal. I mean, I could go back and watch him in some other things, but every time I go, oh, that's right, he's the fake Harrison Ford. He tries to be Harrison Ford. Maybe I don't know. If he's um, trying to be. He just. He, I I have to listen to it again because I, I I don't really hear it. But he's not really playing a Harrison Ford character, quote unquote. Yeah, that, that's um, that's what confused me initially. Do you do you guys have any celebrity voice twins that you've heard about or that you've heard yourself? Mm. Uh, George Clooney. <laughs> no, but he's going to die first if your uh, <laughs> your anti bald regimen is to believe. I've gotten a couple of co- podcast commenters say occasionally that uh, uh, my voice, or at least maybe like my inflections, remind them a lot of David Cross, which is. Uh, very much complimentary oh towards me. I'm, I'm, I very much pale in comparison to that. Another, another bald man that I greatly I was going to say, a bald guy. <laughs> but now that you said it, Mike, that's all I can hear. <laughs> yeah. So I'll just throw in as many double entendres <laughs> as I can without even realizing it. Oh, man. Well, excited to be here uh, to talk about Stranger Things. Uh, Mike, as we've now heard for our preview episode and uh, the beginning of this episode, didn't make it through uh, the first season uh, because he does not like scary things. I don't like scary things either. But if I could make it through, I knew Mike could make it through. And it's I, one and of I my gotta, I, shows. And, I, and I have to apologize. I'm sorry, Mike, for calling you a coward. I, <laughs> That's I, okay. I, 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 I feel bad. I mean, I feel bad now. Do you really Listen, if the, if the kids on these shows can be ca- can be cowards and we're supposed to look up to them as our main heroes, maybe that's something we can aspire to be. Maybe those are inspirational qualities. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm with you, Mike. I got your back. Uh, so this is the first uh, Stranger Things proper podcast, and we're going to be doing things a little bit different uh, than the normal, um, you know, Jane Jack recap type show. Um, in that we're doing two episodes of podcasts um, because this is a streaming show. It's a show that a lot of people binge. I remember when I first watched, it, I watched the whole thing in three days, um, and I think a lot of people did as well. So we're trying to find that happy medium of kind of being able to watch a couple in a row, um, but then also take the time to uh, reflect on the episodes that we watch. So I think we've decided on this kind of two episodes per podcast um, medium that I think could work. I, I know that we, Jay and I have talked about this, but Mike, on the, when as far as binging goes, because sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll binge a show, like I'll watch like, two days I'll watch like nine of the episodes but then I'll hold off watching the last one to kind of savor it Mm -hmm. what do you do I mean Jay just said he watched it in three days yeah I am traditionally not a binger I'm someone who I can watch like one maybe two episodes a day is my preference just because for me I feel like you your mind hits hits a certain limit where everything just sort of starts to blend together and for me there's such a rise and fall to every episode of television that I sort of want to contextualize that and really separate it out now that being said uh my wife is not she is a very frequent binger in fact i'm pretty sure she binged the first season of uh, stranger things in only a few days so (laughs) that's one of the things you know we've we've been dating for about six years we've been married for about two years that's still one of the things that we're fundamentally uh disagreeing upon but i've more so straight into her camp 
a little bit where I can say, all right, let's put on you know a third episode of the day. It also depends for me up- upon length. If it's like a 20 minute to half hour sitcom or comedy, I can watch three to four of those in a day. But if it's like an hour long, especially if it's one of those intense dramas, I, I can do maybe two a day in that set. And with that, we'll be doing that with this podcast with the kind of rewatch of season one uh, with Mike, since he has not seen this yet. Uh, Jack and I uh, are rewatching it with him. Um, And then going into season two, uh, which starts at the end of October, uh, we'll be doing the same thing. So we'll be uh, kind of recapping and dissecting two episodes at a time, uh, which will take us uh, through the month of November. So excited um, to be dissecting these episodes, talking about these episodes, uh, because it's one of the things that's always uh, racked my brain as a podcaster in the binge uh, world, uh, which is how do we podcast about shows that, where they put all the episodes out at once? Um, so you, the listener, let us know if you like this. I think it'll work, though. So we, without further ado, uh, what do you say, gentlemen, that we uh, jump into these episodes? Let's do it. it. All right. So we got two chapters. Uh, that we're covering. Uh, let's start with chapter one, The Vanishing of Will Byers. Um, now, I took this recap from uh, Wikipedia, so I'm just, I'm not showing, I'm not stealing this. I'm just letting you know where the source is. Uh, so, in November 1983, in a U.S. Department of Energy laboratory in the town of Hawkins, Indiana, a scientist is attacked by an unseen creature. I'm sorry, my cup didn't bring up bad memories. Uh, while bicycling <laughs> home from a Dungeons & Dragons session with his friends, 12-year-old Will Byers encounters a creature and vanishes. The next day, a young girl with a shaved head and wearing a hospital gown steals food from a local diner. The owner, Benny, takes pity on her and feeds her before calling social services. From a tattoo on her arm, he learns her name is Eleven. A woman posing as a social worker arrives and kills Benny. Armed men search the diner for Eleven, but she escapes. Will's mother, Joyce, believes she hears Will's voice on a distorted phone call, but her phone short circuits. Will's friends, Lucas, Mike, and Dustin, search for Will in the woods and find Eleven. So we're going to kind of talk about the top moments here uh, for us. Uh, Moment number one, which we already kind of talked about, is the opening scene. Uh, So thoughts about the opening scene, just how it sets up the entire show. Um, What are you guys' thoughts from there? Well, I sort of want to contextualize this also in the the setting as well. Uh, I hopefully am not sounding too ageist here, but I was not (laughs) someone who grew up in the 1980s. So I guess I'll pose the question to my other two compatriots here. Uh, Do you think this show so far in these two episodes is a good reflection of what living in the 80s was like? Or is this sort of like a surface level, hey, here are all these pop culture references we can fit into, you know, one show about this decade? Well, I think for me, I was like a toddler uh, in the 80s. I was born in 85. So I could kind of straddle youth of the 80s and the 90s. Um, I was an adult. Yeah, you were an adult. But for me, I think it is a good representation just in terms of uh, what hanging out with your friends was like um, pre-internet Um, I think it does a really good job of that. And I think that's what makes it fun. It is a bit of a nostalgia grab, but I think it's a good one in the sense that it's evoking um, some of those classic 80s films, coming of age films like E.T. or uh, Stand By Me or the original Mm -hmm. It. Um, Monster Squad was the one that really came to mind for me. That's a staple that we watch uh, for the past couple of Halloweens. Just the very if you if people have not seen Monster Squad, it's a very cheesy Halloween movie where uh, literal monsters come to life and a bunch of kids try to help them. It's fantastic. Um, so that, that's where I don't think it's a nostalgia grab. I think it evokes what pre-internet childhood uh, was like. Uh, Jack, what's your thoughts? Since your childhood was like 60s, 70s? Uh, 60s, 70s. Yeah. I think what it also showed that you could still, as a young kid, you could ride your bike home you know, there was no way for your at night. There was no way for your parents to find you. I mean, either you were home by a certain time or you got your butt kicked. I mean, but there was no cell phones. No, there was no way. So I think that was pretty realistic where I don't do kids ride there. Well, kids don't even go outside anymore, do they? <laughs> no, yeah, they're not on bikes. They're on their hoverboards if they don't burst <laughs> into flames. <laughs> exactly. But, but seriously, I mean, I, I would not let my kids out at not after night after dark i mean there's 
No, but by, them, we, so, by we themselves, ride, I would ride my bikes around the neighborhood with my friends. Um, and you weren't, you know, helicopter parenting me. Um, oh, no, know, we had good, when I was a kid, we had a good life insurance policy on you, but, um, <laughs> but uh, no, seriously, but I, I think it's, I think it's different times. I mean, this kid's, at a, of course, it's a small town and, and you find out later on that the, that nothing ever happens in this town. So it's a shock when, uh, you know, Will Myers, uh, not Will Myers, Will Byers <laughs> turns up messing, um, so but yeah, Jack, I, I guess it. To uh, Mike's original question, do you think it's a nostalgia grab, or do you think it sets a awesome scene for the show versus doing it in modern times? I like the fact they did it back. In, I think it's nostalgic because you know you got like I said, but I, I, again, modern times would a kid be would the kids be would they be do kids still play Dungeons and Dragons? Um, no, I don't do, think do, so. That's what that was my point. Do kids things like settlers ride their bikes and yeah, or like a, Minecraft? Yeah, but do kids ride their bikes? Oh, I gotta be home. Uh, yeah, it's eight o'clock. I gotta get home. Do parents let their kids ride no, their bikes? It would be as I, you couldn't do it. To your point, you couldn't do it because uh, parents today would not let their kids, you know, no. ride oh. home at the in dark. So yeah, and, and so so I think it had to go back and has to go back in time back into a different era because it, it just wouldn't work today. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, I don't see kid. I don't, I don't see kids being allowed to sneak out of the house and, and go, I'm sure there's kids that do it, but I'm, it just, cause I, even, I just think it, if it like one of the criticisms of the show when it first came out was how are these parents like so absent and not involved in what their kids are doing well, or don't know what their kids are doing. And the, at least being set in the eighties lets you give the answer of like, well, you know, kids could still, you know, be out and the parents, as long as they were home at a certain time, the parents were fine, you know? Well, I was, I was part of, I think I was one criticizing too, that the dad, oh, what did I say? You know, it just, he just, you know, uh-huh, he kept eating his food. And so, but I think, it, I think it works much better being in the 80s than present day. Yeah. Well, that, that being said though, I know that from what I read recently, I think they're going to do planning for like five seasons of this mm -hmm. show. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's going to consistently have the kids in it because I believe even going into the second season, they've hit puberty. So I don't know if we're going to do like a Mad Men thing where we follow them into the 90s and maybe the 2000s. <laughs> but we we might get a version, Jack, season five. If it's like the Stranger Things, the next generation where the kids of these kids are, uh, you know, being told not to go outside. Well, they'll, well just be, they'll just be on they'll just be on the Internet going, OK, let's do our research here. <laughs> Uh, they got, let's just attack into this camera. No, he's not over there. He's not over here. So they could just, they could do it all, all from home. Right. It's a good point though. Cause they, yeah, they have said they kind of mapped out five seasons. They just want, they're going to be done at, after that season two. Are they, are, are, are they filming all the seasons at once? So the no. kids are still relatively. Well, here's, here's no? where I think I it works. Season two is a year later. It's only been a year since, you know, they filmed the other one. So if they kind of go, you know, this season's 1984, the next season's 1985, then it's, what, 86, and it ends in 87. Um, if you kind of Yeah, film... so, so they, they, they did the Harry Potter movies, essentially, exactly. and do, like, one a year. Yeah. Then the you problem can is, follow the problem them some... through adolescence into their but, teenage years. The problem is some of these kids are going to grow faster than the others. They're going to their voices. I mean, I mean, I don't know if you guys watch Fresh Off the Boat, but the, the, the oldest kid, Eddie, he literally, I think, grew a foot... And his voice is not, it's, I don't think it's the but same again, kid. The yeah. problem with a sitcom is it's kind of like, doesn't really follow a timeline. If they do the Harry Potter with it, where they just kind of go each year. I mean, they were kids starting out and they ended up in it as adults. So if they follow it year by year, I think they can keep with the original cast. Okay. All mm -hmm. right. With that being then said, I, I, I don't know if you, I think I've uh, seen a commercial lately with, uh, I think his name is like Glenn Matarazzo, the guy who plays Dustin. Uh, doing a commercial for Fios, I believe. And yeah, he is, he sort of hit the, what Jack's talking about. I think it happened with the kid who played Luke on Modern Family as well, where he mm -hmm. just sort of like shot up and his voice dropped <laughs> down like an octave and a half. So it'll be interesting to sort of uh, see what happens with these kids. I mean, I think they're getting a, a lot of big positive press as well, which sort of makes up for the fact that their puberty is being subjected uh, <laughs> quite literally as it progresses over the course of, on film.
Um, let's go to the next, because uh, I think it transitions well to the next top, mo top moments. Uh, so the D&D &D crew. Uh, I'm trying to think of a name just to call the, the whole group, but I think the D&D &D crew works. Um, but the opening scene with them, um, what I love about it is it does such a good job of showing us all the characters and how they interact with each other so that you can quickly kind of buy into these characters. What were your, what were your guys' thoughts with the introduction of this crew? Uh, have you guys ever played D&D? I have. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 like, uh... it's, like, it's like become my new thing. I've, I've never played it when I was a kid for some reason. I just couldn't like find anyone who did it. But they started doing it in my fraternity house near the end of my tenure in college. And now I'm in like a, a real life one and one that plays virtually. And I'm obsessed. It's so much fun. Yeah, I, we played as kids. I haven't played it forever, but I do have an original Advanced Dungeon and Dragons copy in my board game collection. Never played it. <laughs> but in terms of all the personalities, like, what did you guys feel about that? In terms of the introduction of Dustin, Lucas, Mike, Will, I think they did a great job of. of you believe that they're friends. Yeah, because I can remember mm -hmm. being—I can remember it, it's—it's it's been a while, but I can remember being that age, and you know, you're you're ragging on each other, you're making fun of each other, you're like, "Come on, stupid!" You know, the whole different thing. It, I believe that they were actually friends. What I like today, some what some parents would see that and go, "Why are you bullying him? Why are you calling him stupid?" That's just what we do. We could we call each other, you know. But I think I honestly believe they they did a great job of making me believe that they, they were actually friends. What I liked about it too was um, it evoked uh, in ET. I, they I don't think they're necessarily playing Dungeons and Dragons, but maybe some like knockoff of it because they didn't have the rights. But um, in when they're when ET first shows up uh, to Elliot, it's uh, his older brother. I think it's Mike. Uh, is playing with all of his friends, um, and it, it evoked a similar feeling, which I think not only does it kind of set you up to these characters. Uh, introduces you to these characters, but also gives it that context of like a Spielberg um, type movie, which is one of the things I loved about this series. Yeah, I would say that the other interesting thing that it does is that, look, Stranger Things is not really that much of a deep show on the level of Lost or The Leftovers or even Westworld, where it feels like each word almost has a meaning on the paper. Yeah. Uh, but there is some them thematic context here, especially later on when you know, Will sort of caught at this juncture where his character, uh, you know, a, a demon gorgon comes out and he essentially has to either be offensive and cast a fireball or be defensive and cast protection. And he goes for the fireball. He decides to, you know, open himself to vulnerabilities in order to uh, directly go after something. And they channel that later on when Will goes missing and they say, OK, our parents want us to stay home, but let's risk it. Let's go find Will. And that's what leads them to find Eleven. Uh, so I'm assuming this also sort of represents some. Um, the the different tactics that some of these characters are going to use because i'm assuming that things are definitely going to come to a head that you know these guys are going to meet up with hopper and joyce who are going to meet up with this shady government organization and you know how brazen they are i think is a reflection of the tactics that they plan out in this game uh yeah i think that's a really astute observation um and going from uh, the Dungeon and Dragons game, uh, we have Will Byers uh, facing off against the Demogorgon, uh, and you know disappears. Um, at this point, did you think that Will Byers was dead? Uh, watching it for you, Mike Bloom, and I'll, Jack and I, we can say what we thought as well. I don't know. This might be like you know me in a glass house throwing a rock. I mean, the kid kind of looked like he was at that store anyway. He looks like super pale, <laughs> emaciated. I don't want to talk too much about his home situation because it's clear things are rough at the buyer's <laughs> household. But I mean, if 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 whatever took him or killed him had to pick one of those kids, I think Will was an easy target considering he was kind of the scrawniest. I don't know if we're ever going to see Will. To be quite honest, uh, I, I think. Today, in today's pop culture, we've sort of become desensitized, <laughs> so bad to say, desensitized to the idea of dead children that I would not be surprised if this is like a, a lovely bones type of thing and, and we never see Will again. Okay. Um, after that, we are introduced to the character of Eleven. Um, she uh, shows herself in the diner, um, you know, watching it first, like, well, who's this person? Um but very quickly, uh, she shows herself as this very captivating 
uh, character, especially when she stops the fan uh, from moving. But in context of the entire series, uh, this is, I think, a great intro to the character of Eleven. Uh, Mike, what was your thoughts? Well, first of all, hopefully I'm not the only one who experienced this on their very first time watching it. It took me a little while before I realized that Eleven was a girl. (laughs) I'll be completely honest. I was sort of like Benny and the other diner denizens, and then I'm like, oh, I guess there's some sort of a boy with a crew cut here before I realized that uh, it was a girl. So whoops, egg on my face, some nice fried eggs from uh, Benny's Burger Joint. But this was a really nice scene. It's tough to introduce characters that don't really speak. Eleven's going to, you know, get some dialogue out of her in coming episodes. But, you know, to, to introduce a purely silent character just through a couple of looks and reaction shots, I thought this was a good way to do it. Yeah. Jack, I know you... Uh, throughout loved um, and I'm blanking on her name uh, Mil- uh, Millie Bobby Brown who plays Eleven um, you love that though she didn't have a lot of dialogue she did a great job kind of acting with her face oh yeah she's she's of the all the child actors she's by far the best and that's not a knock on the other kids child actors she's just amazing and she, like I said she does it without saying anything and to me, that's the, I mean, I'm not an actor, but that to me would be the hardest part of acting is showing emotion and especially at that young age. So, yeah, I, 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 I also thought at first she was a boy first into the thing. It wasn't until later on that they say, I go, oh, OK, all right, I'm in. But uh, I, I thought she, she's an amazing actress. Yep. So, yeah. Agreed. Uh, next, we are introduced kind of the the big government uh, group led by Dr. Martin Brenner. Um, when poor Benny, who's just trying uh, to take care of Eleven, uh, gets shot. Um, that, was, that was just wrong. Yeah. But I think it immediately kind of shows you the stakes uh, that, that they're facing. Um, which, but it, it was shocking. It was very shocking. And it immediately makes you kind of hate the bad guy in this situation, uh, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that this is also, I mean, I don't think it's really deepened territory, though, which, again, I think that sort of goes back to the accusations that it might be a bit of a nostalgia grab and that, like, this is the very stereotypical villains. This is the E.T. villains, right? It's the shady government organization that wants to capture this creature down to uh, the hazmat suits. I mean, I, I can't really make a judgment about it because we really don't know too much about them. Is was that that's Matthew Modine, right? He's the correct. What's yes. his name? Doctor Martin Brenner. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so I mean, I again, I haven't really uh, seen too much of him. We'll I, we'll talk about you know maybe the, the eleven flashback scene in the next episode, but I'm hoping we we find out a little more about what exactly this facility is. I feel like the show is purposely only showing a showing a sneak peek so that we eventually get the big reveal sometime near the end of the season but my interest is peaked but you know not properly satisfied i think we can be con- convinced they're evil they shot benny <laughs> maybe benny had it coming we don't know benny well, and well, his ben- benny the, the actor who plays benny is also on probably one of the best shows on tv right now is uh this is us so i like benny that's all i'm gonna say well there you go um but yeah i think just in terms of uh that the character matthew modine playing this character i think he does a really good job and I, he's been in a billion things um but i think this is probably one of his more memorable roles um without him having to do too much which works and maybe it's just his hair maybe it's just his full head of silver locks <laughs> no thinning hairline there and it just makes him really impactful yeah normally i'd hate him but I, I can't hate him. <laughs> um, and then the episode kind of close out uh, with two kind of moments. One, Will fries a phone? Maybe it's Will? Uh, and uh, the D&D crew finds Eleven. Um, I think it's a really, you know, considering you have all the episodes there, uh, it definitely makes you want to go like, all right, start another one. Because uh, mm. you want to see what happens next. Uh but thoughts here for kind of the closing of episode one. Should we, can we take this time to talk about Winona Ryder as Joyce? Because again, I'm not on the up and up in terms of celebrity culture, but I feel like 
from what people were saying, this is sort of like Winona Ryder's like comeback performance, yeah. right? She sort of she sort of hit rock bottom after that shoplifting scandal uh, several years ago, but now people are saying like, "Oh, I love this." I now I remember why Winona Ryder is great. No, and and she uh, I think is fantastic throughout this entire season, uh, and I would agree it's a comeback for her. Um, and I think she does a great job kind of capturing. Um, you know, a mother that's lost her son, but not only that, but like a mother that's struggling, a single mother that's struggling just to kind of keep everything uh, afloat. Um, I know, you know, watching it with Colleen, like just that, that, you know, parent that's lost a child connection um, really makes it an, an impactful performance that it's really easy to empathize with. I said this on the binge watch. We said, I said, when did Winona Ryder become old enough to have a high school kid <laughs> and a 12 year old? I mean, it's true. But, but she's, I, I think I don't know. Fantastic. Considering the way uh, we saw Lonnie, something tells me that I, it wouldn't be outside the realm of possibility for her to, you know, get pregnant in her teens or her early 20s and then for it to sort of uh, take off from there. But yeah, I, I think Winona Ryder does a really great job here, though. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know if Stranger Things will go into this type of tropey realm. I really hope her and Hopper don't hook up because they already <laughs> sort of have that rapport going of like they they are very uh, conversational with each other. I don't think the show would get to that point considering that they're going in more of like a freaky deaky uh, type of direction. But I wouldn't be completely surprised if, you know, the, the town worry wart mom ended up hooking up with the drunken cop. <laughs> <laughs> well doesn't the doesn't she have a right to be worried though i mean worry wart i mean her yeah son's oh not... yeah yeah but i mean yeah i think it makes sense it's just tough when again when my writer is great at this but you know every, every she's always talking like this with a very closed tone and she's always worried about will uh so i'm hoping that maybe they figure out what's going on with will so that she'll be able to be uh, a lot less worried i fear for joyce i love joyce well i will <laughs> say uh, <laughs> uh if that's your hope mike uh Prepare to have them dashed. Um, oh, great. <laughs> um, Can, go ahead, I will Jack. say this about the, the first episode. It's, it, it's, it's in this day, I think we'd all agree that having the pilot episode, it's, it's to get people's attention, especially with everything, you know, at your fingertips, you can watch whatever you want. I thought this was a great first episode because it's set, uh, like we said, it sets everything up. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not Shakespeare, but it sets everything up to the point where, like, I've got to watch the second one. I mean, how many times mm-hmm. you watch this? I don't know if I can watch another episode of this. Uh, this is pretty bad. It was like you don't hit the ground running on your first episode. You're almost done. Well, again, it's, yeah, it. it's it's only eight episodes. It's only, you know, a little under eight hours. Um, and the first episode manages to introduce you to all of the main players thereabouts. Um, and you get an understanding of um, what drives each character, the kind of characteristics of each character, um, and that's where I think it's a really, really good pilot uh, in that sense, considering yeah. that you have Joyce Byers, Jim Hopper, Mike Wheeler, Eleven, Dustin, Lucas, Nancy Wheeler, um, Jonathan Byers, um, and within... Steve Harrison. S- yeah, <laughs> Steve, yeah, Steve Harrington, uh, the the prototypical uh, high school douche. Um, it gets you all of that. Uh, so, um, kudos I mean, to chapter. I mean, one. how many t- how many times have you been told, "Hey, you got to watch this show. It's so good." You watch, you go, "What is that person talking about? This show's terrible." Or it's like, "Well, get then you're the pilot. Then it gets really good." Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, and- that's that's the thing that's like you said, Jack. That's tough with um this type of stuff nowadays is because there is so much readily accessible at our fingertips. It's really tough to get new content off the ground and be able to start off with a bang because, like you said, even a show like 30 Rock, which I love, or a show like The Office, which I love, or Parks and Rec, which I love, (laughs) all had pretty rough goings on in those first few episodes. And I don't know if they launched today if they would be nearly as successful because back in the day, even like five years ago, you're almost sort of like held captive. You have to say, all right, well, but I'm I'm not watching this show right now. What else? could I possibly be watching? So you're, you're sort of uh, forced to watch it for those first few episodes until you really catch on to it. Now, if you get bored with the first episode, you say, okay, I have the first episode of all these other shows that are great lined up. Let me check that out. So you really have to produce really credible content in your first outing. And I agree. They do a great job here, especially this ending between 
the phone being fried and the introduction to Eleven, I think it's it's two really big cliffhangers that set up a lot of great mysteries that will hopefully be solved down the line. And I don't think there's any way, like Jay said, there's no way you can sit there and go, it might have been three, four o'clock in the morning going, all right, I got to watch the next episode. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I have to see what's going on. That's and, the only problem with binge watching because you have to go to work the next day. And you're like, going, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm crappy at work today. Uh, you know, Stranger Things. Oh, yeah, I understand. You're okay. Take the rest of the day off. Well, in the in the golden age of TV, uh, the stakes are so high that you that you really can't afford uh, to start off slow because you're like, eh, all right, I'll go to something else. Um, and then once you move on to something else, it's very hard to go back. You know, they used to say that in the 80s, though, too. I think 80s but was, yet, a, was a gold. I mean, again, but they, you had but a they, lot of good TV but, in the 80s. But they would say that in the 80s, though, too. They'd say, oh, you know, if you don't hit the ground running. But, you know, you, but it was like six or seven episodes that you would watch. Now, literally now, if, if it's not good on the first episode, if someone really has to convince me, like, you were saying, uh, Mike, about Parks and Rec in the, op- the Office. I was like, I remember Jay and I watched The Office. I'm like, ah, this is cringeworthy. But then we stuck with it, and it got. It, but Parks and Rec, I gave up on it. I watched the first yeah. season. I go, this. A this lot is- of a lot of people do, and that's I, it's, I just, it's one of those shows where you're like, some people say flat out when introducing Parks and Rec to people, skip the first season. That's just what I start say. with the second season. I, I tell them the same thing because we would say that because Jay convinced me to go back and watch it. And I said, "All right, I'll go back and watch." I go, "Okay, now I get it." But the first season, it was it was bad, and it was terrible. And I tell people, we we tell people on our podcast, "Don't watch it. You're just it's it's not worth it." <laughs> well, uh, they nailed chapter one. Let's go to chapter two. The weirdo on Maple Street. Uh, the boys bring Eleven to Mike's house, where she sleeps in the basement. The next day, Mike nickname nicknames her L. Uh, she says that bad people are looking for her and refuses to meet Mike's parents. Scientists from the laboratory find a substance oozing from the walls of Joyce's home. At Mike's home, Eleven recognizes and points out Will in a photo. Dustin and Lucas want to inform Mike's parents about Eleven, but she uses psychokinesis to stop them. <laughs> While searching for Will, Miss er, Clark, the boy's science teacher, discovers a scrap of a hospital gown outside the laboratory grounds. Nancy goes with her friend Barb. R.I.P. Uh, to a party at her boyfriend Steve's house, Will Brothers, Jonathan investigates the woods where Will went missing. Hearing screaming, he runs to help, uh, but finds only Steve, Nancy, and their friends roughhousing around Steve's swimming pool. He secretly photographs them. Barb, left alone by the poolside, vanishes. Joyce receives another call from Will, hears music from his room, and sees something coming through the wall. So you, you were saying that the first episode does a nice job of building out our main characters. I would say the second episode is sort of an extension in that, in that I feel like we get to know a lot more about the teenage characters specifically. Mm-hmm. We sort of have this, if we're talking about like the freaks and geeks of it all, yeah. they've got introduced to the younger group. Now we're getting introduced to the older group, which is, you know, Nancy, the short-lived bar. We talked about Steve before, and now we have Jonathan, who is sort of like this weird brother of Will, son of joys but also sort of like this weird outcast in his yeah. own right uh the the kid from american beauty who's sort of creepily taking pictures of people and <laughs> filming things in the bushes <laughs> just need that floating bag going around the pool like. <laughs> but yeah you're right and it, it 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 goes into this um it's this you know kind of teenage melodrama to a certain point where you know nancy uh is kind of this goody two shoes and she's kind of dating the bad boy um, and poor Barb is just, you know. Now, if uh, if, Steve, if Steve's fa- if Steve's family had a band aid, would Barb still be alive? I don't know. Maybe they did, blood. but Barb was just so upset she just decided to wrap her finger around with. What did she even wrap her finger around with? I don't know. She was just okay. dripping blood in the pool, which was very. I mean, that's not. And that, that's not. I mean, cool. you, you could on, also Barb. say if this took place in a different time and they had pull tabs on their beers, would this have happened? Right, because she was like, oh, was, she, yeah. was, she, was, was, was she trying to use something to try to shotgun the beer, and she cut herself? Is that am I remembering that correctly? Uh, yeah, she's yeah. trying to like poke the beer. Do yeah, shotgunning the beer, but it slipped, and then <laughs> and of course they all laugh at her. Yeah, I was. Um, I watched um the this movie, uh, another '80s movie, The Sure Thing, for uh, the yes. movie podcast. I do the Hamster Factor, and there is like a lengthy. Uh, sequence and recurring bit about shotgunning yes. beer. So I, I, I don't really do that a lot. Haven't done that even when I was in a fraternity, but um, my life has been full of shotgunning beers for the past week or so. You know, the sure thing is one of my favorite movies. 
so well done. I mean, it's it's Rob Reiner in the 80s where he's really at his prime, and John Cusack is incredible in it. And so is Daphne, Daphne Zuniga. But uh, yeah, I, I never heard of it before because I guess I've sort of lost in the deluge of rom-coms in the 80s and 90s, but, but such a nice movie. It's funny. It's hilarious. And Tim Robbins is in it. Yeah, for like a five-minute cameo. <laughs> Show tunes, and again, <laughs> you know, the, another '80s reference: shotgunning, which is a big part of the Sure Thing. Don't know if that was intentional or just shotgunning was a popular uh, thing in the '80s. Cause is it still popular? I was never cool enough to have the cool kid invite me. To I, his house I, to I, I, beers. I, 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 ne- I never did. Sh- I've never shotgun a beer. Yeah, I don't know. never. Um, so uh, in this episode, yeah, we get the the teenager uh, characters fleshed out, and also in this episode, we kind of have. Uh, I don't want to say, you know, kid romance, but just the, the, the relationship between Elle and Mike um, and the connection uh, that the two of them have. Um, and maybe the jealousy brother, of bro- Lucas and his brother and sister, brother and sister. Is there, a ro- is, there, is there a romance there? Is there what's going on there? What do we think? What Elle and Mike? No, I think it, I think there is a romance. Just so okay. I know. I, I think I think it's more of a pet owner relationship. I mean, this is where the ET comparisons really come out, right? It's <laughs> yeah. one kid trying to hide something from his parents. You're not going to have Eleven uh, running screaming from a closet in this episode. She has her own experience with closets, uh, but it, this does feel very akin to that. So that's the relationship that I'm looking at it as. I'm not, you know, I'm p- putting all of my uh, OTP uh, <laughs> feelings towards Joyce and Hopper instead of Mike and Eleven. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. And you're right because it is very much uh, when E.T.'s in the house, uh, it, he even shows like the his action figures and stuff, which is what Elliot did uh, with E.T. Um, but uh, in this one uh, we get a back or a flashback uh, for L, um, so what do we think about the flashback for L and kind of starting to flesh out her journey to where we saw her um, in the first episode uh, with this kind of her first flashbacks with being put in the closet? I hope the flashbacks are not as scary as that one was because yeah, that one was terrifying. I mean, it's just a girl like screaming bloody murder is uh, not the most gratifying thing to listen to, but. I thought it was well done and it sort of hints towards it seems like she's involved with this Matthew Modine led organization. I mean, we saw we heard in the first episode, we overheard that a girl had escaped. I don't know if she's some sort of experiment. I'm assuming that's why, you know, the head's buzzed short and she's got a tattoo if she's like been bred for some sort of scientific experimentation. If she's some sort of test tube baby, that's my leading theory at the moment. Uh, Well, after this, well, after after this scene there's no there's no argument that the the group is the evil government they're they're bad right yes Yes. um but jack for you you are a sucker for flashbacks uh were you a sucker for this one oh yeah it worked it worked perfectly Um, i mean it just it just it just it showed you know again why why was she afraid why was she running the 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 group the the whatever they're i forgot their name they're they're evil i mean who throws a little girl inside a closet lock her up in the dark and this to them she's just an experiment she's not a person well then but but they're evil i, I for thinking that way i don't agree uh, I'm, not, mr. I'm not like you i i, I don't just look the other way jay I'm, I'm sorry i have to look and say <laughs> uh, hey mr clark the teacher finds a little scrap of 11 smock uh and then it kind of sends hopper uh kind of you know on his chase uh because in a connection uh to Will. Uh, but what do you guys think about this just in terms of his journey? This is where I disagree with the Harrison Ford comparison. Harrison Ford just plays the guy that like doesn't care but kind of cares. Or where Hopper is more of he's he's more driven by maybe the ghost of his of his dead daughter. Mm-hmm. Um, but well, that's, here a, with that's, Hopper. A, that, that's a that's exactly what he's driven by. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, but I, but I would think that the typical stereotype is that like the guy doesn't clean up his act until about halfway through this season where I agree with Jay. He does seem to get his act together pretty much when he like meets Joyce in the station. He's like, oh, okay, let me, you know, get my stuff together and really start to do detective work. You can understand why he's chief of police. And it's not like a chief Wiggum type of scenario where he just sort of locked into the job. I personally hope we see more of this science, science teacher. I don't think we will, but uh, I'm a fan of him because he reminds me a little bit of David Hyde Pierce's character in What Hot American Summer, the like the really <laughs> weird 
science teacher. So I'm hoping we see more of him. I have a feeling we don't. I have a feeling we're not going to get much more of school with all the stuff that's going on outside of school. But even if we only see him for these two episodes, I was happy with him. Uh, I Yeah, I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to spoil it for you. Uh, but I would I would agree that I, I enjoy uh, the science teacher. Um, but, and I think it, it adds... It, it connects it to how these kids are kind of the, the nerds uh, and the, the outcasts, uh, if you will. Um, and that, you know, well, well that, we see that, in the fir- we, that they got. we see that in the, what's it? The first episode where they're being bullied by, uh, yeah. The mouth breathers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so we have will or the ghost of will or whatever, uh, fry another phone, which poor Joyce is not going to be able to afford. She just uh, got an advance. Yeah, she already got an advance on it from the. So I guess she works at that. I would say I wouldn't say it's a hardware store. I guess it's sort of like a just general a general, store. yeah, general store. But yeah, she already got an advance on it. That's another twenty two thirty six down the and, drain, which is and, uh, and, which is and, not and easy was, comings for her. No. And was the dude really not going to give her the phone? I mean, her son is messing, and he's like, "Well, okay, Joyce, I guess I can." Well, okay, because she, well, she makes him feel guilty. I, would you really have to get to that point where you have to be made feel guilty? Man, that's back well, then, twenty-two man. bucks was a lot of money, but it still, was. probably just for inflation, you're, it's like fifty bucks. Her child is missing. Okay, yeah, here, here I, you know, he we'll give you the He quickly goes to it. I, he, oh, like he, a, quit, he after after he was guilted into it, <laughs> but he's a he's, he's a, a small he, business owner. All right, he's probably not. A rich man. He's in a small town with a general store, so he's got bills too. Oh, but he, it's a, he quickly counters it, it, the phone. Okay, figure they probably charge double. It probably cost him eleven bucks. Yeah, did 11? she get an employee discount or anything? I don't know. I don't know. It seems she can never take any time off. So the, this this general store does not have great benefits uh, for poor. Things. She's worked Thanksgiving. She's worked Christmas Eve. Yeah. I gotta. I even to throw that in your face, there, buddy. Oh man. Yeah, I hope he dies next. I hope whatever got <laughs> well gets him. Yeah, he should have gone swimming. It. He should have. He should have done the beer power. Yeah, somebody thing better or cut that general store owner soon. Have him start dripping yeah. blood on all of his precious yeah. telephones. Yeah, let me show you where there's a nice pool to go to here, dude. Yeah, the the next scene uh, is him sitting in a in his closet, just a throne made of those phones. <laughs> yeah. um, I have thousands of them. I made Joyce. Uh, I own her for life. Uh, she knows she, now she's got a phone after phone after phone. I'm sure she doesn't have an insurance plan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so Will or Ghost Will, whatever, uh, plays music. Uh, is it Should I Stay or Should I Go Now? I think, I believe. Um, and should I stay or should I go The now? Demogorgon uh, pushes through the wall, which is really creepy. Uh, Mike, was this a scary scene for you? Was this a cover your eyes scene? Uh, it was a little bit. Spell. I mean, I think the good news is that the music was already loud enough that I was not startled. The the noise is usually what startles me with these jump yeah. scares. So at least the music was loud enough that like I didn't bug out too much or bulge out too much as the uh the this shape did from the wall. But still freaky. I mean, we've seen this uh, when the government was inspecting the shed before. Yeah. They found this like weird goop coming from it. So there's a lot of stranger things going on <laughs> in this town. Uh, I'm looking for a connection. I'm hoping we'll find one eventually. After you watch a, after you watch a scene like this, when you go to bed at night, are you laying there looking at the walls and seeing them move? At all? I mean, I, just... I, I I always do. That's usually my mo when I go to bed. Okay. I see the walls are moving. That's just you know that's just the uh, the drug the uh, prescription drug culture that we live in nowadays. It's just a side effect of that. Hey, it's legal. Um. <laughs> So uh, now I don't think he's actually named the Demogorgon until later episodes um, or t- given that title. Uh, but Mike, you being the probably the more D and D expert, is that a character that's well known in the D and D lore? I haven't I haven't gotten so far into my experience with it that like I don't I don't think it's like a known creature. I have a feeling it's one of those characters that like they made super important here because you know. Even though it might not be mentioned by name, when they talk to Eleven and they sort of say like, hey, do you know where Will is? She like flips the board over to show this black void and then puts the Demogorgon in there as well. So it's sort of like, you know, you you call it by this name, sort of like calling it it because you don't really know what it is. It sort of can be many things at once. 
Uh, so I, I don't know if it's exactly the creature from the mythical creature <laughs> from the Dungeons and Dragons universe, but I guess it's a good sort of placeholder name to give it something. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, and then let's close out here with poor, poor Barb. Um, <laughs> yeah, wait. So, so like now that I've seen it, this is the big fuss that people were making. <laughs> this is the thing that got her a best guest actress Emmy nomination. Uh, nope. <clears throat> nope. What did then, Jack? Oh, uh, well, well, I don't want to spoil anybody. I mean, well, I, to I be get, fair, get, this is this, this is this, the bulk of this, of her work. Is this one episode really? Are you there, Jack? Did we lose you? I think it's. I, what? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, good. Go you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Good. I, no, anyway, I, I think it, I think it's more. I've I've stated a thousand times what really bugs me, but I don't want to spoil Mike, so I'll just I'll wait until Mike until we get to the end, of it, and then I'll I'll say my piece, but. All right, so yeah, I'll, we'll put a pin in that, but that's my gripe for now is that <laughs> I heard so much about Barb. Again, the, the actors who played Barb got an Emmy nomination, which I think some people were flabbergasted by. And from if this is the majority of her work, I thought she was good. I don't know if this necessarily needed to be a big old meme. I guess she seemed like one of the more sensible characters in the universe, so maybe that's why people really sympathize with her. I'm not entirely sure. I think it's just like one of those kind of pop culture moment kind of things with barb and everybody kind of knows a barb everybody's had that friend that's barb and i it's i think it's part name i think it's part those glasses i think it's part (laughs) those mommy mommy jeans jeans. and (laughs) whatever that i I think it's just this you, you combine everything um and it's just this and and the actress uh that plays barb uh just did this fantastic job and again it is small it is very small but um i don't know i i just to me like even after watching the first time you know barb is colleen's favorite character from the show and um because i think she maybe in, identifies with barb i don't know i'm not gonna say that for her it's shannon purser uh, who what who what, plays what, her, what, what about what about uh, uh kim basinger who won a academy award for her la confidential I've never seen it, so I don't know. It's it's, it's literally the same thing. That's all I'm gonna say. Um, would you would you say the same thing for uh, Judy Dench as Queen Elizabeth in Shakespeare in Love when she was on screen for like ten minutes total? Well, didn't uh, yeah. somebody kind of bully people into voting for that? Somebody that might be in trouble currently. Anyways, moving on. But to Barb, I think it. I get the nomination just because she just became this cultural person that. And plus, a lot of people kind of the people that, loved or, I don't want, or whatever. Let's just say the people that vote too may not be taking the time and effort. They just hear the name Barb and they go, "Oh yeah, well, it was good." Barb a bone. Well, you know, well, I, did, they, I didn't really did watch they that closely. Anonymously vote to get the nominees, or the nominees put out and then they vote. Is that how they do it? I, I don't know how they. I, I forgot. Too. I think I think it's a system where like you can submit any nominees that you want to if you're a part of the organization. And then once the, they narrow it down to a list, then I think you rank them. I may be confusing this with the Academy Awards voting system, but I it, there might have just been enough of like a Stranger Things is in the popular zeitgeist. Because I mean, they got a lot of nominations, even though uh, to Jack Chagrin, Bill, Millie Bobby Brown wasn't nominated. Winona Ryder was nominated. The guy who played Hopper was nominated. So there was a lot of attention given to it and i guess like barb was enough of like a meme at that point that they they people were actually making the push for it yeah uh so i'm okay with it but mike and jack are like meh about the nomination of no uh, i I'm, uh, I'm, I'm i'm more upset about that person what's that yeah i, I mean i she was i mean she did a fine job but uh, to me uh, it was best supporting actress right there's like best guest best actress or, or in a drama, guess, I think. Uh, yeah, guest actress. Oh, guess, okay. Well, if you're doing best guest actress, I guess that's just one episode, right? So one or two episodes. Okay. She can have the nomination. I'm not going to take I, that. I, I, guess, I guess I was the, the hype was never going to be uh, lived up to for me just because, again, one of the big things that me being on the fringe of the show, all I heard about was Barb, 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 Barb. <laughs> and this is what we saw. And I'm like, okay, she's a fine character but i don't think she's anything to this is really know. call this is colleen's favorite character on the show she loves barb but again i think it's 
just one of those things when you watch it for the first time and it does kind of become a meme. It does become this cultural zeitgeist thing for her, uh, where if you're just looking at it, I can absolutely see it from Mike's perspective where he was kind of on the periphery of this whole show and you just hear about Barb and then you watch it like, Oh, that's what it is. But if you're watching it for the first time, I think it, it, whatever impression she had uh, is what's kind of led to her popularity. The way she rolled her eyes all the time, <laughs> that, that should have got the nomination. I think that's what got her the nomination. Fair enough. But I, I, why was she even at the party? She should have I left. Blame, she's, she's, I, 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 blame mean, I, think, I think I think Barb, for all of my you know, gripes about her, Barb is sort of friend goals in that Barb really decide to like you know accompany nancy to this party where it was about like nancy getting laid and that's essentially it she probably had a horrible time that was only punctuated by the fact that she got gobbled up by something while she was sitting at the pool maybe it was a maybe maybe it was the line when they're in the cart is that a new bra <laughs> well, no, maybe I, that's what got it but also maybe that's what put, put her over the top. she played the kind of stereotypical horror victim you know like monster movie victim um and uh and i think that also what kind of endeared her to a lot of people um and you do feel <laughs> bad because she could have went home if she was a just like screw you i'm going home uh which is probably what any you know non super friend uh would have done uh she would still be alive so any yeah. opinions about steve's party was it the I mean, was it a, a hip happen in time with the shotgunning beers and throwing people into pools? It was, again, it was kind of your classic uh, John Hughes, pretty in pink kind of what you picture that would happen. I was never cool enough to be invited to a party like that in high school. Nor did I have friends that have a sweet ass house with like a heated pool and all of this uh, Asian 80s furniture inside the house. Um I wouldn't want so, yeah. friends like what, what? What are their names? The two the I, I oh, can't there's Tommy the H, Tommy H, and I wouldn't want them as friends. Can I, can I just be honest and say that? Sure, I, I, I think I, you're I, supposed I, to want them as friends. But I guess Steve just likes it because they just they look up to Steve. I guess um, big man. No, on I think, campus, they're, I think like, they're all just like little assholes, and I think they like sort yeah. of converge together around that. But I mean, Steve is like. Yeah, typical, like, guy walking through being like, study? You don't need to study. I am grateful that, like, he at least helped Nancy study for her test a little bit. Uh, granted, <laughs> he had his own sort of motives at play, as was clear when he came up with the stakes for the game. Mm -hmm. But uh, it seemed like outside of that, he's all just about, like, hey, what are you going to do to satisfy me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah but, uh, but when she said, Steve, my parents are home. Yeah, but your parents don't know anything. <laughs> He's kind of, I, I love the theory that he is John Ralphio's dad. Yeah, um, speaking of Parks and Recreation, yeah, that's great. Because uh, it, it, not only is there an uncanny, uncanny resemblance, um, but there's also just some um, similar personality traits. Uh, John <laughs> Ralphio being more extreme, of course. Uh, but I, I think it, it's something that I learned about the show, kind of behind the scenes, uh, is kind of the actor that they cast for this role kind of changed the way um, they let this character be. Um, and we'll kind of discuss that as this season goes along. Um, so oh, really? I'll, I'll hold that back. Oh, interesting. So he, that uh, so that he, he, this character, I'm assuming, changes then from being hopefully less two-dimensional and more three-dimensional? I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what about Barb? Did Barb have any say in what she was doing? <laughs> No, she did a great job, and she got nominated for an Emmy. So there you go. It looks it, that looks good on a resume. It does. What has Barb done lately? She's has she done anything Riverdale, since? I believe. Riverdale, okay. Uh, the what's that comic with Archie? Ar Archie's. Yep. The Archie show. Archie. All right. Huh. Well, that kind of wraps up the moments and the episodes. Any final thoughts on these two chapters, gentlemen? No, there's a, there's a lot of really fun stuff in here. You've got, you know, the supernatural stuff. You've got the precocious kids. You've got the teenage drama. You've got sort of the crime thriller at the same time. As I said in the beginning, I just can't wait to see how these all sort of meet up and all these threads kind of weave into some sort of crazy fabric. But I've, again, I'm so happy I got to push through these first five minutes. 
because I really enjoyed these first two hours overall, and I'm I'm so excited for the next two as we get to the halfway point of season one. Uh, I agree. I, I'm just excited because because episodes three and four are the scariest. <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> I had to sleep. I I had to sleep with a nightlight on for a week. Oh my gosh! Don't listen to him. Don't listen to him. <laughs> um, so there we have it. Excited when they rip uh, that he- when they rip that head off the kid. Oh my god, that's scary. Um, anyway, uh, I will say I loved it the first time I watched it. And, uh, the second time I watched I ha- it, I loved it even more. I had to, um, go ahead, I had to beg you to watch it. I had to beg you to watch and, it. And, um, so very I excited to be watching again and getting ready for season two. Jack, any final thoughts for you? I, 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 I'm glad we're rewatching it. Cause I forgot a lot about it. And I was like, Oh my God, how this show was. All right. Yeah. Fun, fun, fun. Now, I, I, usually, I'm hoping okay, I'm okay. hoping season two can I'm hoping season two can live up to season one. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm uh, sure I'm, we'll talk about that as we near the end of season one. That always comes to be a problem when you have this sort of big pop culture megalith in the first season. I mean, Lost itself might arguably be a key example of yeah. this. How do you exactly yeah. live up to those expectations? Uh, as a result, I'm going to set mine, even though if, even if I grow to love the first season, I'm going to set mine nice and low for season two, just so I can hopefully, uh, you know, exceed expectations there. I would agree. But I will say the season two trailer is one of my favorite trailers of all time. That's all I of will all say. Time. Um, I, I don't know if you've wow. seen it, Mike. I would probably hold back from seeing it. Just no, I haven't. Yourself. But uh, I love, love, love the season two trailer which I'm sure we'll dig into as we get ready for season two. But that will wrap it up then. I, for... I, I, I love the season two trailer because Barb's in it, right? <laughs> no. Uh, no. Or is she? Um, that does another, it for... another guest enemy. <laughs> uh, chapter one of Stranger Things with Jay, Jack, and Mike. Do we want to have a, a name for our chapter one of this podcast? Um, Anything come to mind? Chapter one. I don't know nothing. I got nothing. <laughs> if, if people out there have a have a title for this chapter, feel free to let us know. Should should we title it "Undeserving Barb"? Um, <laughs> that's harsh, man. That's your yeah, man. Thoughts. You can't take. You can't. But take it works the, on multiple levels. The, it's it's undeserving of what happened to her, and uh, maybe oh, the you, our nomination. Uh, okay, all right. <laughs> Now you're saving yourself on that one, man. I don't know. That's that's a reach. <laughs> um, anywho, uh, <laughs> if you like, well, I guess, call, I guess the I, I guess the actress showing up the podcast is going to be uh, slim and done, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> or Barb? Uh, I th- again, I'm on Barb's side. It's you and Mike that are that are saying she didn't deserve the Emmy nom. Okay, so. Uh, I, no, hold on. Once I found out it was it was guest nomination, I said, okay, yeah, guest. <laughs> She was a guest. So Shannon Purser, you're welcome house. on the show. I'd love to have you on. Uh, she we, was a guest. She was a guest at Steve's house, and all she did was bleed all over the place. <laughs> so give us a call at 385-309-0311. Jack, did I lose you? Oh, I, <laughs> calling time. You I said calling time. It, at least you could be a bar. I just like, said call, stay I, on top. And you know, nope, be there I, for me. I, 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 I've actually done more than Barb did in the whole series. <laughs> It's okay, so <laughs> what's next? 385-309-0311, call time to question comments and or theories. Zero three eleven. And or theories. Oh, Jack wants to be a bit delayed. That's what it is. Just just don't oh, talk, okay. Jack. Uh give us an email at Stranger Things with or sorry, Stranger Things JJM at gmail.com. Once again, Stranger Things uh JJM at gmail.com. Uh join our Facebook group at Facebook dot com slash group slash j and jack group want to thank the people that make this show possible our patrons over at patreon.com slash j and jack especially tack from tokyo eckhart richter molly the millennial and ed the letter carrier uh thank you and thank you to all of our patrons much like npr uh most of our funding comes from you the listener if you would like to contribute whatever you can 
go to jayandjack.com and click on the Become a Patron link today. If you use Amazon, another way you can help is use the link jayandjack.com slash Amazon. Anything you purchase through that link, a small percentage of that sale will go to the Jay and Jack production fold. That will do it for episode one. Uh, other shows we have going on right now, Survivor uh, with Jay, Jack, and Colleen. Mike, thank you so much for subbing in for me this week as I was in Utah. Yeah, of course. For business. Yeah, happy to, happy to do it. I know you were... Uh dancing around trying to get over your fear of crabs as you made your way over to the west coast so i'm happy you were able to do so by the way another plug for jane jack's amazon i looked online and uh there is a stranger things retro phone handset microphone for uh twenty dollars but you can go to janejack.com slash amazon and uh be able to buy the phone and you know, relive uh, some Joyce moments from Stranger Things while at the same time funding Jane Jack. It's a win-win. Beautiful. We'll, we'll <laughs> post the link uh, in the post uh, if you would like to buy that phone. Uh, good call out, Mike. Um, Dancing with the Stars with uh, Heather, Cindy, and Jack, or Cindy, Heather, and Jack. I don't know what that layout is. Um, it's... What's that, Jack? Uh, it doesn't we have none of the heavy goes. It doesn't matter on the order. Uh, you have broadcast. You have the Ramblecast. Ramblecast has dropped so much stuff. You can check out all the podcasts at J and Jock, Jock, J and Jack dot com slash iTunes. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're not a Jock. J and Barb. <laughs> uh, J and Barb. Barb dot com. Not only do you podcast with us, but you podcast a billion shows a week. Um, as well as write uh, for Parade as part of the official mm-hmm. press for a Survivor. So where can people find all of your wonderful stuff? Uh, yeah, so quick stuff that I do weekly. I do a Survivor podcast on Rob Has a Podcast called RHAP B&B, which is just a bunch of silly fun and games about the past week's episode. Recording that tomorrow. That's always a lot of fun, especially now that the season has begun. I mentioned it before, but I do The Hamster Factor, which is a movie podcast with AJ Mass. We're going to be talking about The Sure Thing, which I watched a couple days ago, coming up soon, and then who knows from there. I'm also covering the, this season of SNL. I'm doing a podcast the day after the episode airs with Rich Tackenberg over on Post Show Recap. You can follow all that stuff that I do. Uh, I, I, I post it all on my Twitter feed at a Mike Bloom type. So if you're getting drowned in all the random stuff that I do, I, I, I call everything together there. I mean, it's it's tough for the diehard Mike Bloom fans to keep up, you know. So yeah, Twitter's both a great of them. Way. Yeah. <laughs> well, awesome. All right, so there you it's go. Just There's such a busy project. guy. <laughs> Wait, I just want—I did want to say though, this is how old I am. I saw the sure thing in the theater. That's how. That's how old I am. Yeesh. Uh, that will do it for this first episode. Until next I, time, hasta luego. I think and it, goodbye. I, bye. Bye.